Well, Mark, Mark is a great, uh, great flatterer. Um, <laughs> and uh, 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 I can be too sometimes. <laughs> so uh, I, I've got to start actually by saying that it's extraordinary where this movement has got to. Um, Mark and the team and the volunteers have just created an extraordinary organisation um, in a very short period of time. Uh, I want to talk in a while about where we think it could go in the future. But just for, for now, let's just celebrate the amazing uh, achievement which we've already had. Uh, and I particularly want us to thank Mark. Uh, fantastic organisation, inspiring leadership. So let's thank Mark. <clears throat> Now, some of you know that when Mark was appointed, we interviewed another candidate who had searched the web for any other organisation that had the word happiness in its title. This is 2011. Uh, and what came back on his screen was, your search for happiness has produced no results. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, th this is the world into which we were born. But we now are in a different world already. Uh, not only due to us, but due to a, a huge happiness movement, a happiness revolution, uh, which is going on uh, all around us and of which I think we are a really important part. So, here's what I want to talk about. Uh, first, I want to talk about the two cultures, um, the prevailing culture, which is not the one uh, which we stand for, uh, and the one that we stand for. And then I want to move on towards uh, Action for Happiness as I go forward. So, there are two cultures uh, around us. We meet them every day. Two different versions and visions of what is the point, uh, our purpose in life. So, on the one side, you have the dominant culture, which says something like, the point of life is personal success, getting good grades, getting a good job, getting a good income, getting a good, good partner. Uh, and this is a kind of competitive view of life um, where you do as well as you can in competition with other people. But of course, there are two problems with this. Uh, one is, obviously, in any competition, uh, there are losers as well as winners. But the other problem is that if that's how you think you're trying to do all the time, uh, it's almost as stressful for the winners as it is for the losers. It is the basis of the stress in our society. So it's not, not surprising we've got rising levels of mental illness. Uh, we've got no increase in happiness uh, compared with 50 years ago. Uh, that's the fruit of, let's call it, the harsh competitive culture, which is still dominant. So here, here's the harsh competitive culture at the top here. OK? But, of course, there's another culture, <laughs> which is a gentler culture. So it rejects the idea that if everybody fights their own corner, you get the best possible outcome. It says there are two sides to all of us. Uh, there's the selfish side, where we are at the center of the universe, but there's also a pro-social side. And the whole point of, of culture and the way we try to regulate ourselves is to try and promote the pro-social side of us vis-à-vis uh, -vis the other side. And if you do that, of course, the overall outcome for society is not this zero-sum uh, conflict um, and competition, but a positive-sum uh, arrangement where I get happiness from giving you happiness. And that is what we all, I think, is a, think of as a society. This is what the lady sitting next to me said to me. <laughs> it's what we think of as the, the purpose uh, of the society we want and the purpose that we want for ourselves. So obviously, that idea is not new. <laughs> it's as old as, as humanity. Um, it's in all the world's religions, uh, but it's expressed as a commandment, a divine commandment. Um, but of course, from the 18th century onwards, um, religious belief has been in retreat. Um, and therefore, from the 18th century onwards, people have offered a secular basis for morality, which says, this is the basic uh, tenet of the 18th century enlightenment, I think it's the most important idea of the modern age, that we should live our lives so as to create the most happiness 
in the world that we can. I think it's a really inspiring idea, and of course it, it is the idea which led us to found Action for Happiness. And uh, we, we see its benefits, all of us in our lives, it, it, it protects us against self-absorption, which is a, a major cause of misery. Uh, it's an aim we could, more than perhaps we do, give to our children to, to think from very early ages that their main purpose is to create happiness around them. I think that's a terrific, terrifically good way of, uh, of bringing up young people. Um, but it's also, of course, the goal for us should affect how we choose what work to do, how to uh, make our family, uh, and indeed every other decision that we make. Uh, and of course, it's not a hair shirt philosophy. It's not self-abnegation, uh, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, it says our own happiness matters, but so does other people's. Uh, and the secret of it is to get as much of our happiness as we can from making other people happy. So that's an ethical, a fundamentally ethical idea, which is, if you're talk, talking about the happiness revolution that I mentioned at the very beginning, that's the first element in the happiness revolution, that people accept the goal that we want a happier society. Um, but you might say, how has it taken so long for that idea to gain currency? I mean, if you go out of this door and you talk to people about how they define a good society, they won't all say it's a society in which people are enjoying their lives. They'll find that, come up with all sorts of weird ideas. So, so how come uh, that this idea has not taken root when it was generated 200 years ago? And I think there are two reasons. One is that for a long time people thought that economic growth was going to bring contentment uh, and satisfaction. Um, and it's only after quite a long experiment with economic growth that we realise that certainly further economic growth is not going to make a huge difference to our satisfaction in life any more than it has over the last 50 years. But the second reason is, is that it's only very recently that we've come to know as much as we do now about what makes people happy. So we've got an outburst of new knowledge and that, I think, is fueling this happiness revolution uh, as much as the original idea about you know, morality and how we should behave. So let me say a bit about the new knowledge. I know that my talk was advertised about this, so let me say a little about it, but then I can, I'm come on to action for happiness. Okay, so the two parts of the new knowledge. The first part um, is what you might call psychological. Uh, the uh, belief and the uh, finding that we can train our minds to be happier and more contented. The idea of mind training, that we can actually train our minds so we can observe our negative thoughts and actions, we can cultivate positive thoughts and actions. This is the fundamental discovery, as most of you know here, I think, of cognitive psychology leading to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, but it's also been applied in positive psychology uh, so that it uh, can help everybody, whether they're struggling or not. So it's, the, the, the idea is a very simple one, that we can train our minds. I must say, I only realised about 15 years ago that that's what this is all about, that the mind is trainable. You, you'll find a lot of people don't think they can train their minds, that their minds just happen, or they're victims of something or other that happened in the past. But, but this is the new, this is the new uh, argument, that we can train our minds, and it's based, of course, as far as psychology is concerned, on thousands of scientific trials. So we've got an evidence base for this very simple proposition that we can train our minds to be happy. Uh, of course, and many of you here <laughs> um, have a deep, deep, much deeper knowledge of Eastern wisdom than I do, uh, that, of, of course, was already there especially in Buddhism, also in Hinduism to some extent. Um, and also what's happening in our society is that that wisdom is coming in and people are practicing it. Uh, so in the last month, uh, what percentage of Britons would you think meditated in the last month? Any suggestions? 
seven. But that's a lot. Seven percent is a lot. Uh, it reminds us that we, we are a minority here, but we are the leaven that can leaven the lump. So uh, we've, we've got a wave of new forms of personal behaviour sweeping through our society. Um, but we also want to persuade policymakers. That's the sort of bottom-up part of this. We also want to persuade policymakers to care about this and to spend the money that they spend on our behalf in a way that promotes our happiness. Um, and there we've had uh, some fundamental breakthroughs in the kind of information base which a policymaker would need before they were to choose whether to build HS2 or spend more on child mental health uh, or on university education or whatever. Uh, we, we need an information base, and that's the science, the new science of happiness, which is slightly different from the personal psychology. This is a wider field of science. Um, so a huge expansion uh, in our publication, scientific research on happiness. Um, you can see there that uh, in, in these, uh, these are um, externally refereed articles in journals, uh, 2,000 uh, on happiness um, last year, um, even, uh, dare I say it, in economics, 200. Uh, would you believe it? Um, so, just to let me summarize uh, where I've got to so far. These are the elements in what I would call the happiness revolution. There's the ethical idea, not that new, but new in, in being revived. There's the mind training idea, that's what each of us can do personally. And then there's the science I'm about to describe, which can influence policy choices. So what does the science say? Well, there's only time for me to describe three findings uh, from the book which we recently wrote called The Origins of Happiness, which I believe was in the notice for this talk. Um, so this is based on these cohort studies um, in Britain, Germany, Australia, um, and one or two other places. But I'll just show you the British results. So is, I'm going to be asking three questions. First, if you take adults, <coughs> there's a huge variation in happiness. Um, across the adult population, as you know from your own experience. And what explains it? What are the main factors that explain this huge variation? Well, here they are. Uh, mental health, the, there's a diagnosed mental uh, health, uh, the biggest single factor. Quality of work is interestingly important. So the next three are... Uh, the next two are all to do with what you might call relationships, quality of work, your, whether you've got a, a, a family uh, set up, uh, and physical health matters, income, uh, one of the less, less important um, of, of all the factors. Um, but of course, all of these things, uh, whether you've got a partner, your mental health and so on, physical health, they're all affected by how you were earlier in your life. So let's go back a a step from the adult to the child at the end of childhood uh, and ask what features of uh, uh, the adolescent um, best predict whether the resulting adult will have a happy life. Uh, now, um, I, I know what Michael Gove would say, <laughs> get, get the grades, um, but it's not true. <laughs> uh, you can see that your emotional health as a child is more of a predictor of whether your life will be happy uh, than your grades. Uh, that's very important. But then the next question, and this is the final thing I'll talk about empirically, um, what can affect, or what does affect, your emotional health? I think a lot of people would say, well, there's nothing much society can do, it's the family. Not true. Uh, this is an extraordinary result from the Avon study. So when it says secondary school, it just means which school did you go to is explaining a huge part of the variation of a child's emotional health. Not only their secondary school, 
which they're now at, but also the primary school that they'd left seven years earlier. I mean, this is extraordinary. And they are explaining as much as everything we can record about the family. Now, there may be other things about the family which we can't record, but it's clear that schools do have a big effect on the happiness of children, and therefore that's something which we should use to get them to have a better effect. Um, so those are the kind of, uh, of messages we're trying to send to governments. You know, take uh, uh, school well, well-being and school more seriously, take mental health more seriously, etc., etc. Help the families, support families. Lots of not very expensive uh, forms of activity which would make a huge difference compared with HS2. Um, so we're, we're, we're accumulating an information base that makes it possible for governments uh, to set their priorities so as to maximise happiness. And many governments are getting interested, so let me just tell you very quickly. In 2016, the OECD, the Club of Rich Nations, asked its member governments to, to use the well-being of the people as the goal of their governments. None of them are doing it yet, but it's a good start. All OECD countries are measuring happiness, and more and more are analysing the impact of their policies in terms not of GDP, uh, but of happiness, but not, not fully, <laughs> uh, as fully as we would like. Um, each year, the UN hosts the launch of the World Happiness Report, which I hope you all know about, comes out on World Happiness Day. Anybody know when that is? 20th of March. Um, then there's uh, at the World Government Summit, represented by our friend here, um, in Dubai, there's a happiness day. And then I want to tell you about the wonderful World Happiness Summit. I didn't know they were coming, organised by Karen and Manuel, <laughs> who are here, which is open to everybody. It's not, linked, not limited to officials at all. It's open to everybody. Uh, and I strongly recommend uh, those of you who can to go uh, there next March. So, um, I want to come on to Action for Happiness now. Um, because ultimately, of course, what happens uh, depends on uh, what individuals uh, believe uh, and what they do. Um, so the first thing I want to come back to is this issue of secular ethics and the role of action and happiness, um, which um, has its uh, pledge that relates to secular ethics. So our patron, I think you know, is our Dalai Lama. And here's what he says. We need an approach to ethics that can be equally acceptable to those with religious faith, those with none. Uh, in other words, we need a secular ethics, uh, absolutely. But he does a great deal of wonderful talking. Um, and I've spoken to him. Why aren't you forming an organisation? Now, he's a very wise and, and uh, uh, sensible person. And he knows he shouldn't come and tread on other people's toes in, in other countries. But it's a fact. The following thing, I believe, is a basic fact on which we base Action for Happiness. That I don't think any really strongly held set of beliefs has ever survived without an organisation that stands for it. Just think about that. Can you think of any set of beliefs that has ever persisted without an organisation which stands for it? Well, I don't believe it does. So that's why we thought when we founded Action for Happiness that the world needed a membership, a large membership organisation secular in variety, of people committed to building a happier uh, society worldwide. So we were founded seven years ago. Uh, we've come a long way. We've got uh, 120,000 members, in case you didn't know, who've taken the pledge, 180 countries. We have a million followers on Facebook. And I just want to mention Vanessa. Where's Vanessa got to? There she is. Because Vanessa uh, did the wonderful work of uh, creating, uh, with others, 
the web original website, which has all that wisdom. On it, she's produced a lovely book on the 10 keys. Uh, she does an incredible amount of work with employers uh, improving uh, happiness at work. So I just want us to celebrate Vanessa, if we may. <laughs> So we, we, we got off, uh, we got started as an online movement, but we always knew that wasn't enough. We always knew that there had to be face-to-face -face contact for things to be completely real for people. Um, and one way of looking at it is to say it's not easy to lead a good life. Uh, people who go to church go there to be strengthened and inspired by others to uh, do that. And in the secular society, we need similar places where people meet regularly to be inspired uh, and support each other. So our aim, and we're already, uh, of course, uh, a, a good way towards it, but our aim is to have thousands of groups worldwide where people meet regularly to be enabled to lead happier lives and create more happiness for others. That, that is our basic vision of the future of Action for Happiness. So the first step in forming the groups um, is the course called Exploring What Matters, which many of you have taken. How many people here have taken Exploring What Matters? Wonderful, great. Well, you can maybe say something about it later, but uh, this is an eight sessions, two hours each. Uh, we've now done a controlled trial uh, on how this affects the happiness and attitudes of the participants. There are the participants, and here's the results. And this is actually extraordinary because that increase in life satisfaction there is the same as when somebody goes from being unemployed to finding a job. So that, that is a remarkable, and this is a proper control trial. That's remarkable. And you can see also uh, almost as large uh, reductions in depression and increases in, in social trust. And we've got other measures, compassion and so on. Uh, and we, we also asked them if they feel the uh, impact of the course on their lives are positive, 90%, 95% say yes. So we've had over 250 of these courses have been held so far, and the results are similar to these controlled trial ones. But we need, of course, thousands more courses to happen um, if this is to become a, a nationwide and then a worldwide movement. It's a huge organisational effort. Um, we've got thousands of volunteers uh, who would like to run courses, tens of thousands of people who want to take them. But we need to vet and support the course leaders. And we've got a wonderful um, uh, colleague uh, who is doing that and making all these courses happen and improving them all the time, and that is Alex. Where is Alex? Alex, let's, let's celebrate Alex. <laughs> but <laughs> even more important than the courses is what happens after the courses. Because as I say, we want groups that continue meeting regularly to support and sustain each other. So increasingly, members of a course are continuing to meet in a monthly get-together, um, or they're joining another monthly get-together that's already come out of some other course. So Mark and Alex have produced a great pack um, that can structure these meetings. So the meetings start with a short period of mindfulness, followed by reflection uh, and discussion on the theme of the month, followed as usual by discussions of what actions people are going to take. But the point is that for each month, there's a new different theme based on the 10 keys, one key, one key per month. Um, I think you saw before um, a bit of the calendars which embody the idea for each month uh, and the suggested actions day by day. So we've got materials that are available each month to generate a really interesting and new and fresh meeting uh, and we need more and more people to be joining these meetings. So I think if people are interested in coming to such meetings, forming, they should talk with Alex 
And we're going to try and get the, the website organised so that it's easier for people to find them and so on. So, uh, I've been talking mainly about the course leading to the groups, uh, which is the number one activity. And then, of course, the idea is that the people in the groups would carry out uh, their thoughts and thinking into their daily life, including family life, job, teachers, health professionals, business people, or whatever. So, Action for Happiness is not only involved in creating these groups, but in helping and enabling people to improve the situation in the place where they are working. So, um, we have uh, six really good courses uh, on happiness at work of different kinds, both for managers uh, and for workers. Uh, we have great courses for primary school children, uh, resources for schools, um, uh, training for organisations, and of course we've got um, a, good, a very good course for people uh, with incipient problems of mental health. So, uh, and perhaps I should also add that a lot of us within the Action for Happiness framework spend a lot of time lobbying uh, uh, cabinet ministers and their opposite numbers with more or less uh, success. So there's a lot going on. Um, and I think that what is really important, though, is the number of people involved. So we, we are creating, uh, all of us here, uh, what you might call an army of change makers for the gentler culture that we are trying to create. Uh, we've got a lot of volunteers, and again, I especially want to thank Tracy. Where is Tracy? <laughs> There's, oh, there. <laughs> There's Tracy. Tracy is the leader of the volunteers, and I want us to celebrate her work. Thank you. <laughs> So here's the main point for this evening. Uh, we want to do better. <laughs> uh, we want your th thoughts uh, and help in doing better. Um, so when I've finished, um, we are going to be addressing, we hope that each of each, you will address these two questions. Mark will uh, organize this. Um, so here are the two questions. How can Action for Happiness do better? And how can each of us contribute more uh, to a happier society? That, that's really what this meeting is about. But I just want to end by saying why I think uh, that uh, things are going to go uh, the way we want. Um, and that the happiness movement will become an increasingly big part of our culture and will eventually, hopefully, displace the dominant culture. There are many bad things happening, of course, frightful things. Uh, I won't even mention the American president. <laughs> but uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, increasing self-absorption among young people, must be generated by social media. Uh, we've got a lot of aggression let out, which may, not, may have been inward, but it's now coming out, probably due to social media. We've got uh, migration causing rising nationalism, many nasty things going on in the world. But on the other side, um, there's people like us. Uh, there, are, there are millions of them who are espousing this gentler way of life. So I just wanted to list six hopeful features about the world. One, massive increase in awareness of mental health problems. Uh, if you look at The Guardian, the number of articles about mental health um, has grown uh, in the last eight years by a factor of five. Five times more articles on mental health. That's extraordinary. That is a completely extraordinary cultural change. Uh, and articles on happiness uh, increased by a factor of two. That's also a big, a big change. Should have put them in the opposite order, shouldn't I? <laughs> um, second, a, a lot more employers interested in mental well-being of their workers. Not necessarily doing as much as they should, but it's starting. Third, individuals meditating. 
I mentioned 7%. People are more tolerant on the whole of others and differences. Uh, 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 one of the most extraordinary and unexplained phenomena, except I think we can explain it, the huge fall in crime worldwide. I know there's a little upturn in violence at the moment in Britain, but violence nothing, now is nothing compared with what it was uh, 25 years ago. A much gentler society emerging if you look at the crime statistics. And the sixth, and I think this perhaps explains most of the previous things, is huge increase in the influence of women um, uh, who are just a little more gentle um, and more uh, interested in the inner life and how people feel than the traditional male. So we've got a situation, more and more people saying, why are we so stressed when there's no material reason for it? Uh, this stress, as I've said, is man-made, and if we had better values and goals, we could reduce the stress. So the, the, the vital thing is the change of goal, which takes us back to where we started, with the Action for Happiness Pledge. So there we are. Uh, what we need is an army of people who make, the, make that pledge and then try to carry it out. So please get people to join Action for Happiness. Uh, friends, family, get them to take the pledge. Let us not be embarrassed. I mean, the English are very easily embarrassed. But let us not be embarrassed in talking with our friends and family about these things, because these are really serious things. This is what life is about. Um, we have a movement uh, which I think can and will grow and grow. Uh, and we will all, in our own way, uh, I like to think, be heroes in the happiness revolution. Thank you very much. <laughs> Richard, thank you, thank you so much. Um, do take a seat. So, we're, right. folks, we're going to have a bit of a discussion, sort of explore some of the topics that Richard has raised for us this evening. Obviously, really keen to hear your views, and obviously, I've got various things I'd like to sort of pick up with it that Richard said that I think are really important. But before we do that, I'd love to just come back to those two challenges Richard set, I think, to all of us, and I'm going to think about these myself as well. So what is it that you would like to see this movement, you know, Action for Happiness, but also globally, what kind of changes do you want to see and what could we do more of to help that? It might be to do with your local community, your involvement in schools, it might be to do with your views on national policy, it might be to do with your own personal experiences, workplaces, whatever. We'd love to... to to sort of have you thinking about the big picture and how we can play a role in the change you'd like to see. But then also, this only really works when action comes from each of us as individuals. We can each affect those around us, whether it's in our families, communities, and work, and so on. So what would you do personally? What, what do you feel you could contribute more to that through your own professional expertise, your own personal passion, your own connections and, and inspiration, really? So um, we're going to carry on the conversation and... I'm going to try and find out Richard's answers to these questions as well. But um, I, I'd like to sort of invite you to take a moment to turn to somebody next to you. You've hopefully had a few moments to sort of think about your response to this. Um, again, let's not leave anyone out. So if it's someone you've um, you know, not met before, do say a quick hello. But just share your thoughts on what can we do, big picture, to make a difference with Action for Happiness and more broadly. But also, what would you like to do? And what, would you, what role can you play in supporting that? I'd love to sort of see what emerges. But before we sort of hear any of those views, let's have a conversation amongst ourselves so you can articulate what this means to you. Over to you. Thank you for, for being part of this. <laughs> Again, wonderful to hear such a lot of 
discussion. Thank you for being part of this. Um, we obviously aren't going to have a chance to hear everybody's views this evening, but we would love to hear them in a, in a longer term example. So if you don't get a chance to sort of finish saying what you were hoping to say there, or indeed have a chance to say it to the room later on this evening, please do get in touch with our email. We'd love to hear your suggestions in particular on what you feel Action for Happiness can do um, more of. Um, so we will sort of have more of a, a, a Q&A and have a chance to hear questions and, and, and you to share some of what you've just discussed a little bit later on in the evening. But just to get a sense of what kind of topics were being discussed there. For how many of you did you find yourself talking about some of the big picture sort of political kind of challenges? We need systems to change. We want people to, you know, to be more accountable and helpful education and so on. Is that, is that the sort of thing that was coming up? Actually, yeah. So... so a few, but not that many. For how many of you did you find yourself talking about things that might need to change in something specific, like in schools or in education? Many people think about young people. Yeah, so that's a really clear theme. Um, what about in the workplace? Do people think about kind of culture in the workplace? Is that coming up? Yeah, again, sort of a good third of people. Um, and, and what about sort of things like the media, whether things are being discussed, the influence on the media, or kind of the narrative around society? A few people... Uh, and what, what about local communities, things near where you live, the people you know, the community where you live and so on? Again, a theme, yeah. Families, were families coming up much? Did you see much about families? Yeah, and, and maybe if you wanted to shout out one or two other themes that came up, just so we get a sense. Research Technology, center. research centre, any other things? that Austerity. Austerity, so the cuts and policy, yeah. So the welfare state and universal and basic income as a potential response to the hollowing out. Thank you. Other thoughts? Social media. Social media. Marketing happiness. So not marketing of commercial products, but how we market some of these ideas in a more helpful way. That's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, great. So lovely to hear some of those topics. I can't promise we'll cover all of those in our discussion, and we will have a chance to hear a bit more detail from you. But I wanted to... Um, well, in, in, invite... Well, I, well, I want to ask you... Okay. <laughs> well, what's your answer to these questions? Um, <laughs> I thought I was in control of the microphone here. Uh, so, well, following on from what you said, Richard, what we've discovered is that when people get together face-to-face -to -face in these courses, but particularly this idea of, especially in the social media crazy world, being in a room with other people, sharing ideas face-to-face... That's when I find that we, people, instead of saying things like, that's interesting, that's inspiring, that's been helpful, they say, that's changed my life, that's really made an impact. So when people meet people near them, they have a chance to hear and share real experiences, that becomes really moving and emotional in many cases. And, and so the course has been really helpful with that, and that's part of what we do with Action for Happiness. But um, I think our great passion now is how do we help these things last and ripple, because all the great movements... They're not about going on a course, they're about having a way of being, a way of connecting that lasts. And I think if you look at loneliness, if you look at lots of the challenges in modern culture, a lot of it comes from us being disconnected, from <laughs> losing that sense of what's my own connection with myself, what's my connection with other people, what's my connection with a purpose. So in some ways, that process we ask people to do of tuning in is about reconnecting with yourself, connecting with each other is about sort of this reconnecting in a community, and then sort of taking action, this great theme of ours, is really about rediscovering a purpose in life, not doing a job you find kind of meaningless, not kind of wake up in the morning feeling a bit you know, discouraged that it's another Monday, but actually thinking, I, I've got a kind of mission that motivates me. So at the big picture, I'd love to see us finding better ways of helping more of you and more people like all of us do that, to know people that we can share ideas with, get inspired, make change happen that helps us, but also helps our loved ones, our communities, our workplaces. And the second one was, me, I guess, me personally. Um, well, actually, you mentioned, Richard, these get-togethers that we're hoping to happen, have monthly. And way, way back, a few years ago, when we developed the Action of Happiness course, I had the great pleasure of having a chance to help shape that and run one of the first courses, and I found that a really powerful experience. And I learned a lot from it. And I now thought recently, well, why am I not out there trying to do this next phase of the get-together? So, actually, just yesterday, um, we had our first uh, get-together in Kingston, which is where I live, um, uh, in Surrey, and so I, I'd found that there'd been five or six different courses, actually happened as courses happening near where I live over the last few years, none of which I'd been to or run myself, and I just connected with the people who'd done that, and we 
got together about 26, 27 of us in a room in a pub yesterday near where I live, and we followed the kind of this, this get-together pack that we've been working on of kind of a little bit of mindfulness, chatting, conversation, questions, action, friendship, you know, drinks and, and conversation. And it was really, yeah, a very quite special evening, actually. It made me think there's a real... There's a real model here that we can hopefully scale up, especially when we've got groups around the country where a number of people have done something around you know, Manchester or Brighton or Glasgow or wherever it is. How do we help build a hub there? So I think my personal mission is to say, how can I kind of prove this where I live? Because I don't think we can expect people to do this all around the country, around the world, unless we ourselves engage with it. So that's what I'm, I'm doing um, or trying to do. Um, can I turn the tables back on you now and ask <laughs> your... Um, <laughs> Your, your answer, so what would you like to see us do well, more of, Richard? Uh, uh, as you know, as Mark knows, um, I, I'm, I'm passionate that since we, we, we seem to have such an effect on people um, who come in contact with action partners, that we come in contact with more people, because I think we, we can have a really transformative role um, in Britain and then uh, hopefully worldwide. Uh, and it's kind of frustrating that we have tens of thousands of people who want to take the course, for example, um, and people are willing to offer to do it, but we have to be able to support them, because otherwise we won't have a quality organisation. Um, so in answer to the second question, um, I, I'm the chairman of this organisation, so it's my job to raise the money. And <laughs> um, that, that, that is what, I, what I, 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 I spend quite a bit of time doing in fits and starts. But I think, you know, this, now is the time for another, another big drive of um, endless dinners. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I, and we have the most, this most extraordinary potential, uh, I think, to change our society and change the world. Um, and we need to uh, get the resources where we can just reach more people. Uh, and if you, anybody has any suggestions, uh, gratefully received. Um, but it's not just, of course, um, going talking to people who've got some money. It's also getting the movement known, getting, getting good media coverage, um, getting everyone talking about us. Uh, so a lot of you here, the more you can get us known and the more we can get us talked about, um, the better we will do for all those thousands of even millions of people um, who I think we could, whose life I think we could enhance. So that's, that's, that's my little pledge. But we were talking before, and I said, which I think is, is true, my wife might not agree, I don't know. <laughs> but I think that the pledge, the concept of the pledge, it's a very big one, and it, I, I like to think it's had some effect uh, on me um, in the sense of taking more trouble to be nice to people when I get to work, and all, all just all these little things that one often, certainly I have tended to be, you know, sort of focused, or you might say blinkered is the other word. Um, I, I think the pledge is, a, is an extraordinary force to release the better side of oneself. Uh, I think it, it's really worth pondering it and feeling comfortable to talk to people about it. I, I, as I said, I think <laughs> most English people are quite reserved in talking about anything that really matters. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think that one of the roles of Action for Happiness, and I know this is very much what happens in exploring what matters, is to release people's ability to talk about actually what really And matters. once they start, you can't stop them. But yeah, we, find, yeah. we find people often talk about have, it's great having a conversation that matters. I mean, we're very good at talking about shopping and football and house prices and the weather, and we don't talk about how we're coping and our, who we, you know, the people we care about and how we deal with the challenges in our lives. Mm. Um, bef before we come to a more sort of a Q&A type thing and, and hear more of your own responses and feedback on this, Richard, I wanted to delve into some of the fascinating things you shared with us um, in a bit more detail. So, um, you know, we... we it was really nice to hear you talk about both the sort of personal mind training and the, the impact we can make on ourselves and each other, but also the bigger picture. And I think one of the challenges to some of what we're trying to do here is that, as you sort of hinted at, and some of the observations and themes that came up there now, that there were some quite dark forces in society that are detrimental to our well-being. 
Um, and, you know, quite a lot of systemic problems around the way we, for example, people mentioned welfare and so on, the way we look after the people most in need in our society, or fail to in some cases, uh, the, the way, you know, the kind of disparities of income that, that drive kind of, if not absolute um, lack of quality of life, are certainly a really perceived, um, you know, sense of unfairness, actually, and injustice in society. And, of course, there's quite a lot of this populism rise that becomes about the fear of the other, about the sort of stirring up antagonism and hatred, some of which is coming from policy as much as from media and culture. So at one level, you know, what you're saying is entirely understandable. We need to shift culture. But it feels sometimes, or a critique I've heard of this is that sometimes when we talk about mind training and CBT, which clearly helps millions of people, it's a bit like a sticking plaster. It's a bit sort of letting government off the hook or letting the system off the hook. You know, we've created this awful consumer culture and then it sort of breaks people, so we'll kind of patch them up a bit with some mind training. How, how do you see that? How, what's the right way to think about that? Well, um until the last 18 years or so, uh, I was working on poverty and unemployment most of my life. Uh, and I do think that those are really, really, really serious issues. Uh, and uh, some of the things that are going on at the moment are, are deeply disturbing. Um, but I have been struck that if we think of happiness as the outcome that we really care about, um, there are... That there are other causes, as I showed in the first slide I put up, there are other causes of misery than uh, poverty and unemployment. Uh, and we need a much wider concept of, of deprivation. And I'm afraid to say that, certainly in my party, the Labour Party, um, the, the idea of deprivation is, it, is income. You, are, you identify who is deprived by income. And I think that somebody who is utterly miserable um, because they, they cannot enjoy anything even if they have it, <laughs> it is as uh, serious the, in need of help as somebody who, who um, can enjoy life but hasn't got the external means to enjoy life. So um, I do want a wider concept of deprivation um, and, and a balance certainly between... Uh, the, you know, the, the overall material objective of our society um, and the uh, objective of, of better lives because uh, the, the gross objective is not the same as the, gross, as the objective of better lives. Mm. And you, of course, have done a huge amount to campaign, particularly around mental health. I mean, we do have much more investment than we had in proper uh, sort of responses to mental ill health in particular. But I know, I mean... Am I right in saying that you're, you're, you're still quite concerned about the lack of investment and particularly around children's men mental health? What, 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 sort of, what would you like to see happen in terms of what, what a good government response to this broader way of thinking about deprivation? Well, for, for adults, we started uh, the Improved Access Psychological Therapy uh, programme 10 years ago. And it's now reaching 600,000 people a year. But there are 6 million people who would be diagnosed with depression or anxiety disorder. So, I mean, it's still 10% of, 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 of the population in need. So the adult thing needs to be further expanded. Um, but we've got a bit of a commitment to that. Child mental health, some of you are involved in here, I know. Um, we had a green paper last year which had in it what we had urged, which was the setting up of something rather similar to the Improving Access Psychological Therapies Programme, but for, for children who came below the CAMS threshold that had serious problems of anxiety or behaviour or later uh, in adolescence depression. Um, and that is going to be rolled out. Um, it's begin just beginning to be rolled out, um, but slowly. Uh, and CAMS is still struggling. I mean, CAMS had the most terrible cuts uh, due to simple lack of thought, really, because the local authority cuts were just passed on to CAMS. Um, so these, these are shocking um, uh, instances of bad priorities in the past uh, and not strong enough priorities uh, for the future. Uh, and... I think we, we, what we're talking about is, is a, a different role for, an additional role for the state, really, because um, 
And the state did very little 150 years ago. And then it took on the task of turning people into good workers. And then we had the National Physical Health Service. <laughs> um, uh, but we haven't taken on, the state hasn't taken on the role of helping people to be better people. Um, and we actually now have a knowledge base where if we had good family support, good parent training, the time of childbirth, good help with parents with, in conflict with each other, uh, domestic violence, good help with lonely, people who are lonely, whole area of these personal uh, aspects of life where society, collectively, it doesn't have to be the state, it could be charitable bodies, but I mean, the, the, these are collective responsibilities we have to our fellow citizens to help them to be able to help themselves. Uh, and I, I think we are talking about a wider role for the state, mm. but not... Not, not, not focused on GDP. Mm. And just uh, before we move back to sort of some of the personal and sort of um, movement type aspects of this, I suspect people here might be interested as I am. You talked about how you, behind the scenes, have conversations with politicians and try and lobby for some of these changes. Um, clearly, loads of progress has been made, but you must, I'm sure, be frustrated with some of the responses that come back. What kind of barriers do you find yourself running into in conversations with decision makers about trying to prioritise this more? Well, I think they're all part of the harsh culture, almost, almost all of them. Uh, I mean, they think that uh, the basic problem facing the country uh, is an economic problem um, uh, of how to win in some extraordinarily mythical contest that we're meant to be having with China uh, and, 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 and India. I mean, this is completely extraordinary. It's very bad economics. But um, they think that you know, the education system, what's that about? T making people into good workers to fight the fight against India and China. Um, and, you know, so you'll find expenditures all over the place. You know, the, to, to spend a billion um, on industry, a drop of a hat, but to get, what have we managed to get for adult psychological therapy? We've managed to get 350 million pounds after a 10 year struggle. Uh, I mean, you have to fight for every penny as you know it when it's a social problem. If it's an economic problem, oh, HS2, I mean, what is it now? It's going to be 90 billion, isn't it? Hmm. So I think it's, I think it's a, this um, materialism. It's, it's basically, uh, going back to probably to Margaret Thatcher more than anybody, we've got this materialistic culture where policymakers think wealth creation is the test. Is, is this thing going to uh, create wealth? I liked what you, well, the way you frame this as a happiness revolution. I guess we could think that we've had an agricultural revolution, an industrial revolution, an information revolution. The, this next revolution is around our inner lives in, mm. in some respect. Um, you know, you've, you've been working in this area for some time and you've, I think, I, mean, I, I have seen that you've led some really pioneering changes. I mean, I, for a while, I think you were, certainly in my visibility, you know, a major, well, the first economist that I saw sort of talking about we should change our view of what progress looks like. Um, do you feel in your professional and wider friendship lives and as we look around us that we're feeling more of this? Because I think I have a slightly myopic view because I keep meeting wonderful people like those here this <laughs> evening and people who are passionate about this and I get a sense that culture really is changing because I meet people that care. Do you, do you sense that we are having that personal conviction about what really matters? And Well, there are surveys which show that people, people think that people are more psychologically aware than they used to be. That those sorts of things. Um, I think that I showed you, I had another graph which I didn't show you <laughs> on a number of references to mental health, but up five times in The Guardian. I mean, that is a, that is a big change in that, certainly in The Guardian readership um, part of society. I think there is a big change going on, the more people meditating. You will be amazed, I, I can't name names, but you will be amazed at the number of cabinet ministers, top civil servants who have been meditating secretly <laughs> <laughs> for many cases, 20 years. 
But one, one cabinet minister told me uh, that when he went into politics, um, he decided it was going to be tough and he ought to learn to meditate. So he took a meditation course as a prophylactic uh, for a politician. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. But, uh, you know, he'd heard about it at least. He'd read, he'd read some article in the Times and he, he got hold of a teacher. Um, I, 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 so I think that there's a, there's a big undercurrent there. Um, it's obviously stronger among women than men. Um, but, um, you know, all these psychological professions are growing very, very fast. Mm. Um, I mean, the huge increase, when you think of the huge increase in the numbers of not only psychological therapists, um, but uh, counsellors, coaches. I mean, this is, you know, this is surely is a big social change when people are wanting to talk to somebody about something rather than keeping it to themselves. Mm. Even, if, even if it, when they first start talking, they may think of as rather external, they end up a bit, a bit more internal. That was my personal experience, <coughs> definitely, yes. Mm. Um, I'd like to sort of open out to um, the audience and sort of hear more feedback of things that you said and also any questions. Richard, was there anything else you wanted to add or ask before no, we do that? No, okay. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Great. Well, um, let's start by... Well, um, in, in terms of doing this and hearing a variety of views, I, can I suggest that you either share perhaps your own response to what we could do or your own response to what, you, what you're doing or a particular question um, for Richard rather than trying to do all three of those things um, together. So, gentlemen here, um, we've got microphones. If you could wait for a, um, a microphone to come to you. Well, thank you very much for those thought-provoking ideas. I'd like to take up the issue. It seems to me that our society, historically, has made an enormous contribution to happiness. I think of the establishment of the welfare state. I think of education. It's quite stunning what we've achieved politically and socially to increase people's happiness over the last, say, 60 years. So I want to raise this issue now of what's the relationship. And when I looked at these questions, questions one and two, when I looked at question two, I thought about it, and I thought the best way I can contribute to a happier society is to oppose Brexit with all my strength. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so the question I'm asking you is... How do you see the, the relationship between... Poli you touched on it a little bit, but I'd like if you could ex perhaps expand on that. The relationship between politics and action for happiness. It seems politics must be involved. Well, politics can make people miserable, as you just described one way. Um, but also, of course, they, they have the opportunity to make people happier by providing the kind of services that I was talking about before, if you, a slightly wider role of the state that took more seriously problems that people have in their families, in their communities, uh, and uh, didn't actually, which is what's happening at the moment, dismantle what, uh, what, uh, an awful lot of what we've got, the dismantling of the youth services, the dismantling of the elderly services, the dismantling of child protection. I mean, this is deeply shocking. So politics sets the frame in which ma many of the things that we do operate, particularly the things that people who are vulnerable do operate. Can I, can I add to that? Because I think it's a really, really fascinating question because it gets to the heart of, in some ways for me, what's the connection between personal change and social change? And uh, at one level, you think about what can I do personally, and you feel much as we've all felt when we were encouraged to change a light bulb to solve climate change, that that's kind of a drop in the ocean in the context of what's needed. And yet what we see, I think, consistently in this movement building, and, and to your point about are we building a political movement, I think not directly, but hopefully indirectly. And let me explain what I mean by that. So the interaction that I think I see with Action for Happiness concepts is something that starts with a very profound personal connection to this is something that is important to me, it affects my own life, it connects with me rather than just being an intellectual thing that others should change. It's a kind of sense of who am I, what matters to me, 
how do I deal with adversity, what do I care about, who, who do I look after, and so on. And that then very rapidly becomes a sense of, I would like others to discover this same sense of connectedness, same sense of helping others. And so sort of it goes from individual well-being to altruism, to compassion, to connectedness. What I see beyond that, and what happens in these courses and community groups, is a sense of, what can we now do? What should we be creating together locally, but also what should we stand for? How should we vote? Who should we care about? What issues should we care about? Um, so I totally agree that something like Brexit could be de incredibly detrimental for, um, you know, for, for massive aspects of our well-being, and having a political view on that is a responsibility we all have as individuals. But I think our unique role with Action for Happiness is to help people sort of wake up to themselves and what matters to them, and then live that through their relationships, through their voting patterns, through their campaigning. So it's, it's political change through a, a movement rather than from a policy paper or a campaign thing, because there are plenty of other organizations doing that in a variety of ways. So, so I hope that makes sense. So I, I, I don't agree with this idea of, you know, the criticism of meditation is, oh, how can sitting there quietly affect anything? You know, you're, you're disengaging from the world. I think what we see is when people are more in tune with themselves, they become more engaged citizens, they become more compassionate, more likely to act, vote, behave, and campaign differently. That's, that's my hope on it, and um, you may think that's naive, but I do think we're, we're seeing that, and I think it's a really, really good challenge and good question. Um, let's move on. Let's, uh, other observations, other responses? The lady at the back there, thank you. Could we get her a microphone so we can all hear you a bit better? Thank you so much. Sorry. Um, I'm a secondary school teacher, and about eight years ago, I did invite you to come to my sixth form to speak. You were unable at the time, but I've been following um, everything going on, and, and I've been to the, um, what, uh, the, the course, What Matters, or as my friend calls it, happiness classes, um, and... <laughs> What I see in schools, I'm in one of those rare schools where we believe in educating the whole child. It's a secondary school. We're not an exam factory. We believe that actually what happens in school makes your person, makes, uh, sets you up for life. What I would love to see is work, something working with you, with our schools, coming into schools, running a version of the course in schools for teenagers and actually making that work. Because I've got students and they say, Miss, we need help with our you know, mental health, with the pressures of exams. And I've done some of the stuff from the happiness course with them, obviously adapted, but I would like to see a lot more of that in schools. Mm. Well, good for you. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I, I very much agree with that, and, and I'd just like to take the opportunity to... Is Peter still here? Let's be Peter Harper over here is one of a, t a team of wonderful people who've helped us develop resources for schools. We have a particularly great toolkit for primary schools at the moment. Um, uh, the question that's obviously coming up is, what's the secondary school equivalent? And Peter and Val and Vanessa and others have been leading a series of discussions with experts about how can we better help Secondary schools are also doing a project at the moment thinking about universities, and Peter and Val have been developing some resources for even younger primary audiences as well. So there's obviously a demand across that age spectrum, but I totally agree with what you're saying about the need for this and the educating the whole child and the, the sort of avoiding being an exam factory and keep up the great work. Richard, anything to add on that? You, you're passionate no, about No, I mean, I, I believe in that strongly. Um, I've been involved not strictly through Action for Happiness in the the so-called Healthy Minds uh, project in, in uh, 32 secondary schools, which is one hour a week for the first four years of secondary education. Really, really well-structured course with proper teacher training. Uh, it, you can't, what you can't, why, why PSHG doesn't work in most schools is that the teachers are not trained to do it. I mean, it's just shocking. Uh, so they've got, we've got to have them trained. But of course, we need a, a whole school ethos change towards putting well-being up higher, uh, values education higher, um, a different goal for education uh, mm. uh, alongside the exam. Uh, so, I mean, one of the issues, I'm not sure what you think about this, um, Gus O'Donnell, who's very helpful to us, the former cabinet secretary, he believes strongly that we won't be able to counter the exam culture unless we also measure well-being in schools. And I think that may well be true. Um, so if we want schools to take, take it seriously, that we may have to ask them to measure it. Not perhaps compulsorily, but once enough schools did it, everybody would have to. So th thank you, Richard. So we've heard sort of a political question, a sort of schools education question. Any other themes that have come up for people we'd like to just get at diversity? Hello, thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. I just want to share what I have done because I think this is really important for everybody here. I went on the Action for Happiness course and I did that in um, April and May. And I'm going to ask Mark here. I'm actually, I live in Surbiton. He's in Kingston. I want to be invited to your next yeah, gathering. Yeah, I wonder why you weren't. I'm sorry <laughs> so about that. The first, Roland Chester. Do you know him? Yes. Okay. I do. So he taught my cor the course. I went on that course because I wanted to find out what drove people's happiness. I really have, from a young, young age, thought everything in life, whatever you come up against, find the good in it. I teach that to my family, and I wanted to see what actually drove the people in the course. When Roland saw me walk in, he thought, oh my God, mad American. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, he said, you were the one who allowed everybody to open up on this course, and you made the course. And I'm not putting myself on a pedestal, but that's the movement that I wanted to have at that course. And what I will say is that to move forward after we were done with the course, I actually did a WhatsApp group. I got it together and we meet every month. And we also um, share the different calendars that they bring out. I share, we all share with globally our friends as well, because obviously I'm from the States and keep in touch with all them as well as other parts of the, um, the world. And also um, I share with my children's secondary school because they have a lot of mental well-being problems and they don't have the time to teach the kids. So I send the materials and I help them and they are just amazed. And Roland wants me to teach an Action for Happiness course, and I will do that. Thank you. So what's your name, sorry? It's Chris Andrews. Chris, thank you so and much. Because it's, it's, a, it's a lovely example, really, which, which is we see a lot, which is people who connect um, with this and with a personal conviction and then can have these ripples. And we think of ourselves as not necessarily being able to have an impact, but I think what your story shows is we do have these really quite powerful ripples in lots of different domains, and that really can make a massive difference. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'd love to tell you about the Kingston gatherings as well. Um, I, I also thought, because of what we've talked about here with these community connections and ongoing, it will be a, it will be a really a miss of me to not mention um, the, the, the wonderful Happy Cafe Network that um, Stan, one of our... Is Stan here? Yes, Stan is here. Oh, hello, Stan. Um, Stan. Stan, we've mentioned at many of these events before, helped create this original Happy Cafe concept in Brighton. Uh, I think there's now over 100 cafes have copied this in the network, so it's, it's taking a sort of venue-based approach in addition to the sort of more course and gathering-based approach where it's somewhere you can go and not just have a cup of coffee but connect, find friendship, talk about the things that really matter. So, again, if you'd like to find out more about that, do talk to Stan. But the, this combination of schools actions, local gatherings, places where people can meet, uh, and workplaces and so on, this is how we build um, a movement. Richard, did you want to respond to that point about the course, or is that...? No, I was, I was just fascinated. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to run out. Stan, do you want to add something? The Happy Cafe Network is more about reaching out to people who are not particularly aware of the sort of things we've been talking about, um, in contrast, in a way, to the courses and the other things which draw people in who already have an, a, an interest in psychology and, and, and uh, personal well-being. So with Happy Cafes, you, you get out into the community, you get out into the high streets, you, you, you have cafes which are displaying Action for Happiness material, and um, there's a possibility of having these, the, if you like, the Exploring What Matters course, a much gentler version of the course in Happy Cafes, you know, uh, on once a month. Um, so, in terms of what Action for Happiness can do to make a bigger impact, I would suggest it, it's about reaching out to people 
who are not particularly aware or interested in what we're yes, doing. Yes, I really like that, Stan. That whole idea of community building is something we've been talking a lot about. Just for anyone who doesn't know, I, I suspect you may have seen the, the independent publishers, something called the happy list, which is a kind of nice antidote to the rich list. Very happy to see that Stan made it onto this year's independent happy list as someone who does a huge <laughs> amount to bring happiness to others. So good work, Stan. Um, well, well. We, we are... Are you going to ask them to write? Yes, so we're rapidly running out of time, and um, I would like to encourage you again to um, do get in touch with us about your ideas to this, um, this, this question of what we can do more. What we'd love you to sort of go away with, all of us to go away with this evening, and we will obviously love to stick around and have more conversations, but is for each of us to leave here with a sense of something tangible that we might each do individually. We've talked about big picture questions, Richard shared with us all kinds of inspiration behind the movement things that need to change, ways we can get involved. Um, what we try and do with every Action Happiness course um, is to sort of leave with a personal action. So whether that is responding to something Richard's shared with us, whether it's something you might do in your own community, someone you might tell about this, I'd love to encourage each of you just to take a moment to think about something practical that you might do, and if possible, especially in our digitally enabled days, if you might want to make a note of that in some kind of to-do list, calendar, we know that when we kind of consciously make a note of something you might do for your own well-being, something you might do for somebody else to spread these ideas, to help a loved one, to, to change something at work. Now's a really good time to capture that idea of, you know, what's your particular passion? How do you want to use your own conviction for this to help make a difference? So I'm going to take a moment. Let's all just take a, a sort of moment of mindfulness just to think about how can we leave here this evening with a sense of conviction, with a sense of something practical we're, we're going to do ourselves that can contribute to this. Thank you all so much for being here and for everything you contribute. I have three final things before we... Well, two final things, and then Richard, I know, has got a, a reading he'd love to share with us as our kind of final moment of the evening. So first of all, um, thank you huge thanks to the volunteer team for all the amazing work they do. You could really help them and all of us by um, helping to bring any kind of rubbish or things to do with the drinks and snacks that you've got back towards the bins on the way out so we don't leave a mess uh, in the hall. Uh, and our next event is back in here on the 9th of October, so it's actually very soon, with the wonderful Mo Godat, who's a former Google executive, um, who was a, has, has been for many years a, a passionate thinker about happiness and what really matters, and then had the tragedy of losing his son, um, who died due to a tragic medical accident, and Mo was forced to really put his kind of practice around what really makes for happy life into practice in the most devastating of situations. Wrote a very, very moving and interesting book called Solve for Happy, uh, and brings a very unique perspective of someone who's been at the most senior levels of Google as a business executive, but has this very strong personal story. So he'll be with us a couple of weeks uh, on, on Tuesday the 9th, back in here. Um, so do join us for that if you can. Um, I just wanted to, before handing over Richard, to say thank you to all of you for being here. And maybe um, we, we would, I'm sure, like to show our appreciation for Richard, but I'd almost like to say let's invite you to, to share your final thing, Richard, and then we can yeah, yes, respond. Yes, well... Um... I don't know if you know when the Dalai Lama wakes up. He wakes up at 3.30, which is, I think, just about what it is now, something like that, <laughs> um, wherever he is. And uh, what he does is he then starts doing five hours meditation. Um, but this is his prayer that he meditates around, at least the one he first meditates around. May I be a guard for those who need protection. May I be a lamp in the darkness, a resting place for the weary, a healing medicine for those who are sick, a vase of plenty, a tree of miracles, and for the boundless multitudes of living beings, may I bring sustenance and awakening. So maybe we can try and do that too. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much for being here. Thank you all.